All right. Hello, hello, everyone. How are you doing? I hope um, uh, you're doing fine and you're joining us today for the kickoff of uh, a new season of um, the next live show. This is something that started out of um, out of this uh, pandemic and um, we actually moved along and now we have a very nice set of um, experts and people from all over uh, the world that will be joining us and we will be talking about exciting scientific things, hoping to uh, bring, uh, bring some information, some knowledge and have uh, some good times. Uh, today we have Professor David Allman uh, who is uh, joining us uh, as well as uh, Professor Joshua Tarbutton. We're going to be talking about uh, Scrum for hardware and systems design and I have to start by saying that both professors Alman and Tarbutton. So when I was teaching senior design 10 years and 15 years ago, um, I would be referring to the book and I'm like, oh, this is such a cool guy. How did he think of this? And here I am today. We're talking with uh, Professor Alman and um, the author of one of the most prominent and famous books in uh, mechanical engineering design. And Joshua is perhaps one of my closest friends since I moved to the United States. Uh, he was my colleague at the University of uh, South Carolina, and uh, I'm so happy that we maintain to have a fun and great relationship. So David and Josh, I'm so excited that you are joining me today. Glad to be here. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for putting this on. That's really great. This is awesome. So I'm just, uh, this is, first of all, I can see a lot of feedback flowing in. A lot of people are saying hello to us from um, from different places. So David, Matthew, Abdullah, Neptali, uh, Ali, Hassan. So we have a lot of people that, um, that are, um, you know, com commenting and listening and are tuned live. So let's go ahead and get uh, started with um, the discussion and actually presenting uh, presenting um, uh, you guys. So, so this is the session. It's Scrum for Hardware and System Design. I am very excited to learn about this and about these challenges that uh, we're going to be talking about. Professor Alman, would you like to present yourself a little bit first? Sure. Uh, I'm a retired professor from Oregon State University. I taught uh, mechanical design. Uh, starting about 1984, uh, I started teaching the design process, and by 1991, I had published the book that Rami so uh, kindly mentioned, The Mechanical Design Process, which is now in its sixth edition. Um, I'm a life fellow with ASME. Uh, I've designed all kinds of products. I've started a couple companies. I hold six patents. I'm very active in consulting and writing on the process of making uh, mechanical and system products. That's awesome. And you are actually not only someone who wrote about design, you are a designer of bicycles, electric airplanes, and, um, and, and other, other products. Right. I'm really pleased to say that within the last month, I, I've received a NASA grant to do some of my electric airplane work. So I now, instead of being self-funded, I now actually have some real funding. So, so, so this means we're going to have a follow-on session where we're going to be talking about uh, about your work. So an electrical airplane you mentioned? Sure, but that's not the topic for today. No, and thank you for keeping me on focus. Josh, uh, would you like to present yourself? Uh, yes, so I'm currently the uh, an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Um, Josh. Josh, you have to get used. You you have been promoted recently. You're no longer an assistant professor. You're an associate professor. <laughs> I'm recently a tenured associate professor at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. I'm also the assistant director of research for EPIC, which is Energy Product, uh, a Production and Infrastructure Center uh, that uh, works with a lot of the large en energy researchers and manufacturers. Uh, I'm a licensed professional engineer, also a recent accomplishment. I'm a certified scrum master. Uh, I got about 50 papers uh, and a few patents and I designed the Bravo walk which is a 
uh, no pull dog collar. Uh, and I also own a, um, a one-stop engineering design and uh, fab company uh, located here also in Charlotte, North Carolina. This is awesome. So thank you so much, uh, both uh, David and Josh for presenting yourself. So um, Professor Alman, David, tell us a little bit about the outline of the presentation today. So what, what is the flow that we're going to talk about? Well, I, I came from a very traditional design process background. My, my schooling is in aerospace and uh, the, the book, The Mechanical Design Process was fairly traditional. And um, about two years ago, I got really interested in Scrum and I've dragged uh, Joshua along with me in, in learning more about it and, and trying to understand how it can be applied to mechanical and, and systems uh, products. So I'm gonna give a little bit of background on Scrum. We're then gonna talk about um, an introduction to 13 challenges that we've identified that makes Scrum more difficult for hardware and systems than it is for software, because Scrum is very popular in software. And then at the end, we'll talk a little bit about some uh, uh, things that you need to be doing in order to make Scrum organize, uh, work in your organization, if we get that far. If not, it'll be in a following uh, presentation. As long as it's exciting and uh, the people tuning in. So this session is approximately going to be around an hour. So let's go ahead and get started. So why bother with Scrum for hardware and systems? So what is it that we're uh, looking uh, for in here? Excuse me while I play with my, my computer screens. Um, OK. so. Scrum's pretty interesting because it's a, it's a design process methodology compared to to waterfall or stage gate, which we've typically used for years. And it was developed by the software guys, software design methods guys, because they felt that the success of, of software projects was really low. And this is some actual data from software, not from hardware. And as you can see, using a traditional method, the vast majority of the, the projects fail. And, and fail just means that they didn't make uh, their, their cost and their, their performance measures. And when they started doing Scrum, they developed the Scrum methodology. And like I said, it's become very popular in software. And as you can see from the statistics, it hasn't solved all the problems, but it's certainly uh, made many more um, software design projects come in on schedule and, and with the, the functionality that they're supposed to have. So that's a big driving force. Uh, a second set of statistics, if you go to the next slide, Rami, this is uh, some German data. Uh, it's interesting about Scrum that, that Scrum's developed in the US for software. It migrates around the world. Uh, the Europeans, more than anybody, have been applying Scrum to to hardware systems, uh, except in some new companies like SpaceX does sort of a scrum method and other, other young startups are, are, are using a scrum-like uh, structure. And I'll, I'll refer to Saab also, they, they do scrum. Um, so some Germans did a, a survey and they said, don't trust these numbers entirely, but they are indicative. And they asked two questions. They said, what do you expect from applying Scrum, and what results do you get? And as you can see from these statistics, uh, what they got and what they expected were not exactly the same. So uh, they expected to accelerate product delivery, uh, and they got that. But if you look all the way down at the bottom, they didn't expect to improve team morale, but they got that. Um, they managed change, Scrum's very good at being a reactive uh, methodology. Um, this traditional stage gate or waterfall is really rather locked in. And if there's change in the product or change uh, in the specifications, or you suddenly can't get material X or whatever, uh, it doesn't react very well where Scrum does. So for new products, Scrum is really, really powerful. Uh, and you can read down these other uh, 
indicators. Again, don't trust the numbers 100%, but they certainly are indicative. I mean, um, what's what's what I like about this chart, and as I was like looking into it pre in preparing for today's session, is the difference between the reason and the benefits. And you can see that there is some agreement, like plus or minus 10% between both of them. But there is one of them that jumps uh, massively, which is the team morale, from 38% yeah. to 61%. Josh, can you, because you've implemented that, can you comment a little bit on that? And before I let you comment, we have a ton of people watching us live. If you have any questions, please go ahead, put it in the chat box, uh, throw your question, whatever it is and we'll make sure to put it on the screen and answer it. So Josh, how did how, team morale, like, can you talk to us about this? Yeah, so uh, as David said earlier, he, he sort of dragged me into Scrum and has really uh, tra uh, challenged uh, my understanding of the best way to deliver uh, quality. So uh, in our research group, uh, we practice a style of, of Scrum, uh, and I think we'll get into some of those details later. And uh, it, and we also practice it at uh, Bravo Team, which is a small engineering firm that I own that has uh, seven full-time uh, engineers. And Scrum is is what we use to uh, basically increase the transparency of the work and uh, really facilitate uh, what we call passing the ball. Uh, so there's no ball hogs or people that get stuck by themselves. And and it it dramatically changes the uh, the team morale because um, people are working towards a common goal and often in you know engineering we we're, we have tasks that never seem to end and the, another thing that I think scrum does that helps morale is it allows uh, people to kind of time box effort so they can they can say if they had a good week or not. They can look back at the, in their review or retrospective and they can say, you know, according to our agreed definition of done um, and delivered value, did we have a good week uh, or did we not have a good week? So it allows people to have some some successes and be able to adopt for change, which I think overall uh, makes people a lot happier uh, instead of never feeling like you can get out from under the work. I have a question here, uh, David. I'm not sure what is NPI. I don't know if this is a common terminology that you, any one of you knows. If not, we can ask. New pr new product introduction. All right. So is Scrum mainly used for new product introduction? It's. A, I'm working with a customer right now that has a mix of uh, engineers that, that are developing new products and other engineers that are supporting existing products. And we're finding a middle ground between what aspects of Scrum work for each of those uh, two design uh, methods or those two design problems. But where it really shines is when you're developing new products and you have unknowns, uncertainty. It's very good with that. All right, that's awesome. So, um, um, with so let's talk about the 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 sub that you the slide that you have in here about uh, this design. Okay, um, I've spent some time interviewing one of the middle level managers at Saab, and uh, uh, he's responsible for the oxygen systems in the Saab Gripen. The Grab the Saab Gripen, if you're not familiar with it, is fairly similar to the USF thirty five. It's about the same size, same speed, same capability with munitions. It's not stealth, whereas the F-35 is stealth. The other big difference is, is that the Saab Gripen costs about 10% of the F-35 is field maintainable, which the F-35 isn't. Uh, it was designed much quicker with much fewer people. And they used a scrum methodology throughout and uh, this slide, what it's trying to get to is just, uh, and I'm going to come back to it in just a second, but um, it, it's giving an introduction to that because I'm going to use it as an example. There's about a thousand engineers involved and they're broken into a hundred scrum teams. I'll explain that in a second. And they work in three week sprints. I'll explain that in a second also. So, so, so question, um, and 
so did they use Scrum for the hardware and the software, like for the manufacturing and for um, the systems on board and the avionics or what was like? Everything. Everything. So Scrum yeah. was used for A to Z. Everything. Oh, that's awesome. All right. So, so we talked about Scrum. We talked about the potential benefits, a case study where what was used. So let's understand. Let's delve a little bit more um, the detail into a brief introduction to Scrum. But before that, we have a question. Um, does the project risk include cybersecurity measures? And why is the project risk placed at the bottom of the list? So they're talking ab about the benefit list. So uh, it wasn't placed at the bottom for any particular reason. Uh, this was just, um, there was actually about 20 different measures that were used in the original study. Uh, I picked the measures that were, uh, had the highest scores to show in this. So there was certainly no, um, no intent with order. Um, the, the Scrum will address whatever you want it to address. It's a methodology. So if, if cybersecurity is what you're working on uh, or is, is something that's important to your project, then it doesn't affect things one way or the other. All right. I do have a couple of questions. Go ahead, Josh. I was just going to add that because Scrum is uh, customer centric uh, with with defined roles, there's there is a person that would go that I think David's going to talk about between uh, what would be very important. So if cyber security was something that was very important to the customer, then it would by the very process trickle its way into uh, a sprint of work that the team would would be able to deliver with a very focused, measurable definition of done. Awesome. So I do have a couple of more questions. I'm going to leave them till after you, we introduce a Scrum uh, to make sure that uh, the listeners um, and the viewers are actually a little bit more informed as well as myself. So let's go ahead and start with a brief introduction to Scrum. So this is about the cycle. What, what do you want to tell us here, David? Well, what makes Scrum unique um, and, and keep in mind, we're going to do a 10 minute introduction here to what is usually a one week course. Um, what makes Scrum unique is that you break all the work into sprints. And a sprint can be anywhere, is typically from two to three weeks long. But I know that Josh, for the particular company that he has, Bravo Team, they're using one week sprints. And, uh, but what a sprint basically is, it's where you, you do some organization, you do some planning, then you do the work, which is a smaller circle you see here. And then at the end of the work, you do a retrospective. You know, what did we accomplish? What worked really well in our process? What should we be doing different next time? Those kinds of things, which is not typical in engineering to go back and do a retrospective. And then you come back around the cycle again. At Saab, they have three-week sprints. They've been doing three-week sprints for 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 10 years and every three weeks they start a new one of these two circle cycle uh, structures and within those if you go to the next slide okay so and and here you can see the end on end and as I said Saab's been doing this end on end for for many many years go to the next slide also so if you go to my work, which I'll give you some links later on, and, and Rami's going to uh, post some, um, I developed this diagram that tries to get to all the building blocks and steps that you need to be doing. And as you can see on the left-hand side, there's the various planning you need, uh, uh, various uh, pre, pre-scrum things you need to be doing. Then you can see the two cycles within the diagram. And altogether, there's about 12 steps here. And the different symbols are, are either meetings or artifacts that are established. Um, as Josh mentioned earlier, there's specific team roles that you have to establish um, to get things going. And it, it, uh, it gives you a structure that you don't have for what's happening and how information is generated and how uncertainty is managed. 
that you just don't have in the prior methods. All right, so I see a lot of information on, um, on this chart, but if I understand this correctly, uh, basically what you're doing is uh, you're taking a big project and you're chunking it down into smaller pieces and for each one you're doing a sprint cycle on it and this is how you perform continuous improvement. Did I get it right or? You got it right and one of the advantages of the sprint or, or the, the, the scrum methodology with its sprints is this breaking it down into smaller chunks to work on because one of the beauties of, of Scrum, I mean, I see, I see design as making decisions and communicating those decisions to other people. And it forces uh, a tighter cadence of making decisions and communicating those results to others. Because you may be going down the wrong path, but if you're not, if you're not getting any feedback, <coughs> excuse me, you're not getting any feedback that you're on the wrong path you won't know that and you waste a lot of time and energy and money and this this shortening of the of the design cycle if you will um i see is very beneficial so so i have a couple of questions the first one is should we worry about losing the big picture by like zooming in in this way like is there is there like something that uh, talks about not losing the big picture? The big picture, uh, there's actually a slide coming up, I think I left right. in there, about how Saab does not lose the big picture. All right. Uh, but the big picture is driving the smaller picture. All right, perfect. And one question for Josh. So what what drove you to bring it down from a two, four week sprint cycle to one week? To like one because um, uh, most of our customers are early on the uh, design phase or product development phase, uh, we don't have projects that would be like very many projects that are like 12 month projects. They're usually um, we need this designed and delivered yesterday and we have no time left. And so in order for us to negotiate uh, the demands, uh, we we found that we needed to basically re it's hard for us to plan the work for two weeks out um, because we get stuff done pretty quickly. Um, I did want to make one more comment too on the, the big picture. This is, this is Scrum also has its roots in the, um, the Deming cycle, which is the plan, do, study, act uh, cycle. And, and also it has roots in the Toyota production system and really it kind of collided with a couple of uh, publications like the new, new product development system, which was a study of how companies made copiers. And, um, but it was really the software people that took this with object oriented program and started to organize uh, very complicated software projects because there's so many moving pieces. Um, and they've been very successful in using it. And so I think from a big, big picture, it is statistical process control in, in okay. one sense where we actually are planning, we're doing, and then we're actually measuring or studying so that we can take better actions instead of the traditional, you know, we show up and put 40 hours in and hopefully, you know, we're all going in the right direction, which it's real easy to get too far down the road. All right, awesome. So, so now that we've introduced the Scrum, before I switch to section three about the challenges, um, I do have a question. And the question is uh, Scrum versus PMP, uh, which one is uh, better? David, uh, would you like to take a stab at this question? Help me out with PMP. Uh, project management planning, I want to say. So Mahsan, if you can actually, so I'm going to ask this from, from everyone. It would make things easier if um, we don't use abbreviations, if you just can put uh, the whole word. I, I think PMP is a project management planning uh, tool. So um, since we're not familiar with PMP, we're gonna say, we're gonna skip this question for now. How about I can, that? I can address it slightly. I, I sort of thought I knew what he was asking. Okay. Um, there's less planning here and actually I'll get I think the slide is still in this deck. Hang on. Um, bear with me just a second and I'll double check. Time. 
that the slide I want is still here. So, so we have an answer from, from Matthew Pe Peterson is that uh, PMP is Project Management Professional. It's a certification for project management. Okay, I took the slide out that, that would have addressed that. Um, at Saab, for example, they have very few project managers per se. In fact, in the Scrum lexicon, the word manager is gone. Okay. They don't use the word, it's a no-no word. You don't use it um, because the teams are self-managing. It's trying to, what it tries to do, it tries to drive the decision-making down as far in the organization as it can. Okay. Now, a slide that I took out of this deck because it was too long, but it's in some of the references that you're gonna get here, the slides in there, it shows that for the, for the Gripen fighter, there were 300 top level requirements. That's all there was for this whole fighter. And by the time it gets down to the, 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 the person who's in charge, I won't use the word manager, the person who's in charge of making sure the oxygen system occurs or comes into being, there were only 15 requirements that got down to that person. Everything else happened to his seven teams or happened within his seven teams below him. And so the seven teams are self-managing. So in a lot of ways, you could say Scrum is conflicting with PMP, and uh, I think that's a safe statement. Josh, you want to throw in anything there? Yeah, I would say I think P PMP is often associated with somebody who would go and get a certification, um, and they I think well, I have not taken the certification, so I don't know, but it it, it they will have a philosophy of how to manage projects well. That is, um, from my understanding, more of a a waterfall or stage gate. I think there's a lot of which that's you know associated with that. And it's it's not Scrum, but I don't know if you. I mean, maybe you maybe you can get a a project management professional and get certified in in a Scrum uh, way. So don't have much to add there. I I actually I'm I'm more curious now because you said that the word manager does not exist in the in like the context of Scrum. Uh, let's uh, let's start with the challenges of using Scrum to design hardware and system. And we're gonna collect more questions and uh, get back get back to them. So, so let's go ahead and get started. Well, before you, yeah, on that slide, um, the 13 challenges, um, we don't have time today to do those. So I pulled out the five most important ones, but here is a, um, uh, the bit.ly address will lead you to uh, a YouTube video I did on, on these. And also there was an article in Machine Design last December where I, I itemized the 13 challenges. So we're only going to do a couple of them. Um, and one of them that I took out does have some more information on what Saab's doing. All right. Uh, and I took that out. So I want to highlight something very, very important for uh, all the viewers is that Actually, on the archive page, you have access to these charts and the links in them, and you can actually click them and uh, navigate because there's plenty of resources that uh, David has put in, in the charts that you can use for later if you are uh, further interested in the topic. All right, let's talk about challenge one. Okay, so challenge one. Um, software is really nicely modular, and... This makes um, the ability to have one person working on one module or one small group of people working on a module much easier than it does in, in systems and hardware in general. However, that being said, what it does force, it forces you to think about stable fixed interfaces. And what I mean by that is, as you break a problem down smaller and smaller, because we're doing smaller time chunks, in the ideal world, the interface between different subsystems or different components or different assemblies would be stable and fixed. And that means that the interface is agreed to before the parts and assemblies are designed. And when I first heard this, uh, when I first started studying Scrum and I heard this, I said, you know, this really sounds familiar. 
And I went back to my book, The Mechanical Design Process, and I don't use those exact words, but when I talk about how you should design, I talk about designing the where the components come together, the 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 the, the I, I basically talked about interfaces and didn't ever use that word. Uh, but I now when there's a new edition of the book, I will be talking about stable fixed interfaces because it, it gives the lines of communication that makes them very, very clear about what things you can be doing when, on the parts and assemblies you're designing versus other people and what the information is that has to flow between those. I think this is really important. I, I, I agree and I see why this is challenge one. So challenge two, we're talking about longer design cycles. Yeah, the the um, in the idea, if you read any scrum literature, they're going to say at the end of each sprint, you should have deliverable software. You should have something that the customer can try and break. And from that, you can learn. And from that, you can improve things. Well, that's really difficult uh, in hardware because uh, you can't generate hardware in two or three weeks, except you can more now than you used to be able to with with rapid prototyping and 3d printing and all the other the laser cutting and all those methods you can produce things much quicker there's a second part of this and that is well maybe you don't have to deliver hardware maybe you can deliver drawings or you can deliver concepts or or something but the goal is in the sprint is at the end of each sprint you have something you can show the customer that says, are we on the right track? Is this what you had in mind? And the waterfall method is very much not that way. Uh, many companies that I do um, consulting with, they talk to the customer very seldom. They'll have these big design reviews at the, each, at the end of each stage and then get some feedback. And uh, Scrum forces you to get, keep that feedback link open. In fact, there's one person on the Scrum team that is the voice of the customer in the ideal Scrum world. So, so, so actually, um, I think I'm getting the gist of it. It's basically uh, really um, deconstructing the process and bringing a smaller version of the bigger process and making sure that the heart uh, of failure, which is feedback that is not incorporated until very, very late often in um in the in the cycle it's actually being brought like at the heart of it and you are gradually providing feedback instead of saying at the end a or f you're actually saying hey well you're going along the right track i think that's correct all right challenge three higher functional interdependence um in, in the book, The Mechanical Design Process, I, I push very much in conceptual design for focusing on function and letting function drive form. Um, and in doing this, uh, you can lead yourself down a rabbit hole that's not good also. I mean, everything has good points and bad points. And if you take function and you drive all the form from function and there's a single form for each function, you end up with some nail clippers that look like this. And uh, the problem with, with hardware is that one, one form can provide parts of many functions. The example I like to give is the handlebars on a bicycle. A bent piece of tubing is usually the handlebars on a bicycle. By themselves, they offer no function whatsoever. Um, you, need, you need the rest of the steering uh, parts in order to have the steering function. You need the uh, frame to do it for the handlebars to provide balance. You need the, the grips uh, for the brakes. So you can't design that way. Whereas in software, generally, you can break out a little piece of function and design it because the form and the function are the same thing. And that, that means there's a challenge here. But it still means that design, it, it in no way negates that you have to drive from function to form. You just have to be really, really careful, and it's a challenge. When you were presenting that, 
and you're talking about that. I don't know why the Tesla Cybertruck came to my mind that they uh, focused uh, mostly on uh, on function and somehow they abandoned form. And it was a right, it was a good bet. I mean, they are successful, but um, so, <laughs> Josh, you, you want to add something there? I'm oh, sorry, I had my mic muted. I was just laughing at your comment. Well, 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 you know what is the quote of 2020, Josh? It is, uh, you're on mute. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> all right, let's move on to challenge five. So higher need for specialization. Okay, I skipped challenge four because, like I said, this is only partial. And by the way, Rami, I'm not too sure I agree that the cyber, uh, the, the truck, the Tesla truck's been successful. I mean, they haven't sold one of them yet. Uh, they aren't even in production. So that'll be the proof of the pudding is, you know, do they understand their customer in a way that, because uh, in a lot of ways, Elon Musk um, ignores the customer to a great degree and tries to push the customer in a direction. So, you know, there's always, in design, there's always this balance. Um, uh, fair enough point. And I, we will we will wait and see. I think... I think, I mean, there's a little bit of both. It's just the concept of how it looks. It's so particular. Um, this is what uh, this is what made me think of that. So challenge five. The whole the whole name of Scrum comes from rugby, the ball game, and in rugby, um, the the whole team swarms around the person with the ball, and the ball can get passed off from person to person. And that's where the name comes from. And in software, what the ideal world would have is that, that the team of, of programmers, if one programmer is in trouble, you know, can't get something to work, the other programmers can swarm around that person and try to help them make the, make the situation, uh, improve the situation. In hardware, you can't do that often. Uh, one of the groups I work with right now that, that design uh, pressure gauges their design team has one guy that does um, the packaging. He's the hardware engineer. They have another guy that does the PC boards. They have a lady that does the, um, the, the firmware. Uh, they have another person that does something else. And they only have one person. And if the firmware person is in trouble, you know, they can't get the firmware to work right, the hardware guy can't come over and help because the domain is enough different that that can't happen. Whereas when you're writing code, if one person's writing in Python, there's other people that know Python and they can come over and help. So this specialization thing is a, it, it sort of makes it much more challenging in hardware and systems than it is in software. Now, on a side note, I think that's why we have to train engineers with more diversified skills that's a very important point, uh, Josh. And this uh, actually, this deserves a session on its own. Is talking about um, whatever you want to call it. I mean, NSF now has a new term for it: convergence or multidisciplinary. It all means the same thing, which means like don't be in like in a very narrow. All right, that's awesome. Actually, there's a term. There's a term that's used in the Scrum community called a T person, and what a T person is is they have great depth in one area and they have enough breadth to help uh, in other areas. Um, and I didn't realize it. Um, I'm sort of a T person, but I'm actually a T person with a number of stems that go down because there's three or four areas where I have pretty good depth, but I have really great breadth. And, and so the, it's, a, it's a warning against being too specialized. I, I, this is, this is a super valid point. And the problem is you're saying it and I'm thinking, and I'm trying to build my own T or stem or whatever it is. And I can see, I can see how this can lead to, uh, to, to, to be a problem. And I can see how being a T person is, uh, something that is, uh, desirable. So challenge 13. And by the way, as David said, um, uh, all 13 challenges are, available in some of the literature that David is presenting, and he is just presenting uh, five of them. So challenge 13, David. Yeah, um, 
I was just listening just this morning to a presentation on, on SpaceX and SpaceX was very, the reason they got into space so fast is they would make a commitment if they could and then try to break it. And there's always a, a danger of premature commitment, but if you can do it and get away with it, it's great. And what I mean by that in software, I mentioned earlier where the whole goal is to get something out to the customer for them to break. Well, in hardware, we're, we're used to traditionally saying, oh, in order to get something out to a customer, we got to go through conceptual design, then we got to go through production design and optimize that. We got to build the production plant. Then we have to, to, to go through the testing and, and all these things to get things out. And, and of course, the, the cost is, is locked in very, very early. Even during conceptual design, you've locked in a lot of this cost. And, and that's true, you still have to go through all these things. Whereas in software, if you throw away some code, you've, some guys spent 40 hours writing it, okay, we write off 40 hours of their time. There's no hardware, no, none of the, the, the hardware associated with testing and all these, uh, the procurement cycles and all those kinds of things. So one of the goals here in this challenge is, you know, how can you get things so they can be used by customers and seen by customers and uh, and get some feedback and communication without spending a lot of money and it's a it's a real challenge and um, back to the, to the cyber truck I mean one of the things Elon Musk was doing there was uh, he was rolling out this truck long long before it'll be in production and what he wanted to do was listen to what everybody said about it you know um, they said it was ugly. They said it was pretty. They said it was functional. You know, all these kinds of things. He wanted to give as much feedback as quick as he could. So it costs more in hardware and systems, but the feedback is so critical. Can you find that balance? So it's a challenge. This is, uh, this is, uh, so, I mean, I, what you said is exactly what, um, even sometimes, uh, the movie industry does. They roll a trailer to get a perception of people and they change accordingly, not only to build... Uh, so, for example, like you just reminded me of the outrage that happened on the Sonic character. So when Sonic was released, people like that were committed to uh, Sega long ago, they did not like what they saw and they ended up changing the character um, so, so I can totally see the point. By the way, we have um, an inundation of questions. So um, we're going to keep moving and then I'm going to go back to, to all of them. Actually, let's get a couple of questions before jumping to section four. I'm going to start with the first one uh, by Dante and a shout to Dante. Dante was one of my students. So if the term manager is not used, um, is the term scrum master used? Is this like the terminology? There, there, there's three classes of people on a scrum team. There's a scrum master, and the scrum master is the person who's worried about the, the, the process. They want to make sure that everybody has the tools and the time to do their job. And we'll, we'll, I'll clarify that in just a second. The, the second person on there is the product owner. This is the person that that brings in the voice of the customer and communicates with the other teams to make sure the product is what it's supposed to be. So the, the, the scrum master is worried about the process people are going through. The, the product owner is worried about what's being designed and what's being tested and what's being done. The rest of the people on the team are the doers. And the scrum master and the product owner are making sure that the doers have everything they need and all the information uh, that they need in order to do their job. So those are the three, three cast of characters. And as you go up in the organization, hang on, let me do one more thing first. As you go up in the organization, so let's say this is down at, at the leaf level, at the branch level, you'd have the, the different product owners talking to each other to make sure it works across multiple teams. You have the scrum masters talking to each other to make sure time's being managed and information's being managed correctly. 
I was going to just add to one of the differences between the philosophy of manager versus scrum master is that the scrum team, which is ideally four to six people, I think they said the ideal is 4.6, which I haven't figured out how to do that yet. But um, they say that the team is self-managing. And so the team is that has very clear objectives of what they want to release in the sprint. And so they don't need to be managed. Uh, they just need the work and they need to know what success looks like. They need it to be clear. So, so nobody gets paid to make it employees uh, or people on the team. Uh, the employees are working together because they know what success looks like and they pull together like a scrummage in rugby uh, to get the ball down the field. Okay, that's awesome. So I have another question. Uh, uh, what does the T stands for? And I think I'm going to take a stab at that to see if I'm being a good listener. Uh, the T is more of the uh, shape of the letter T where you have uh, breadths along the orientation and then you have the specialization along one or two or three fields per se. So it's not really the letter T as, mu as much as it is the shape of the letter T, right? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear. Uh, you're absolutely correct. It's a symbol. And and I describe myself as having a lot of vertical depths that I can go down. You could call that an M person if you wanted to. Um, but these are just using letters as symbols to to indicate um, where your, your knowledge and expertise is. Actually, Russell Barton says he called that a jellyfish person. So... <laughs> What, whatever works. <laughs> whatever works. Uh, there is a question about if we can share a presentation on SpaceX. I think this is going to come at a different time. Like if we do live or whatever. Uh, I'll tell you something about that. Um, I, I've, uh, I have a book of, of uh, design process case studies um, that has 16 case studies in it. It's also available uh as an okay. online course and i've been pushing for the last couple of years to try to get a spacex uh case study and so far i haven't been able to get anybody to talk to me uh, because the way i write these case studies is i write the case study working with somebody on the inside and with the permission of the organization and i just just today found a new contact uh to reach out to spacex so the answer is no, I do not have a good case study on case uh, on SpaceX. Yes, I am working on that. I would love to see it also, and I'm willing to put in the time to write it when I can get enough information. So, so I'm going to go ahead. And uh, so I have plenty of folks that works at SpaceX on my, uh, on my LinkedIn. So I'm going to go ahead and say, if you work at SpaceX, make sure you reach to Professor Allman for a very important reason, because if you want to have engineers that graduate that are job ready, they need to get educated and the education process happens through uh, such case studies. I'm going to take one question before um, I jump to the last portion in the last 10 minutes that we have. Um, we, it's, it's actually two questions. Uh, which software should be used to manage the team or develop the product? I think it's going to come shortly now. And can you suggest any book on this topic? So why don't you take a stab at this question? Josh, you want to talk about the software first? And sure. Doing more of that? There's a lot of um, there's a lot of software that's available uh, in in classic Scrum. They use sticky notes and uh, argue heavily for them. Um, we tried sticky notes at Bravo Team and in my research group uh, due to the nature of the work and the uh, age of the people that we're working with, uh, we are now on Trello. And Trello has its roots in Con Kanban, where you basically pull work through stages, um, like a manufacturing process. Uh, there's, there's lots of beautiful overlaps, but we don't have time to really go into detail for those. But um, Trello is very powerful. There's actually templates. Um, but I think anything that you can use that's very simple to get started is, is, is useful. Yeah, uh, Trello was purchased by Jira, and Jira is another uh, very popular software. But these are these are just for managing the tasks that are doing and and controlling what is 
what is in what's called a backlog versus what's being done now versus what's what has been done. Um, uh, other than that, you use your regular CAD tools, analysis tools, whatever you have to actually do the design work. Uh, uh, this isn't, you know, this is just how do you manage the information? Much like you would on a, uh, um, a Gantt chart, this replaces the Gantt chart to some, to some degree. All right, let's go ahead and get started. In the last few minutes we have, uh, on section four, so making Scrum happen in uh, your organization. So, sure. what are we talking about here? I put together this checklist, um, and and it may not be complete, but it's a pretty good checklist. And and first of all, in order for this to happen in your organization, you have to have some champions. Um, and it's best if the champions come from above. Uh, I have one customer where. I actually have two now. They were the upper level management said, you're going to do Scrum. The software guys are doing Scrum. You hardware guys need to figure this out and do it. And then I have another organization where somebody, a middle level manager says, I want to do Scrum, but the upper level management isn't ready for it. It's a family owned, um, very hierarchical, very managed organization. And they don't stand a chance of being successful with this, with their current structure. And um, and I think they know it, so they aren't really going that direction. So that's the first two items. You better have an executive sponsor or you, you don't stand a chance. Um, you have to be aware, one of the things I do when I go into a company is I, I do an analysis of how they now do, uh, what their current design process is. And a lot of companies have a written design process, and that may not be the same as what they really do. Uh, sometimes there's a real disconnect there. And so the first thing I always do when I go into a company is I interview a whole bunch of people and find out what's really happening between somebody in marketing coming forward saying, hey, we need this product, or some engineer coming up with an idea saying, hey, I got this new technology, let's productize it between that and something rolling out the door. What really has to happen? What happens in the organization? you got to do an assessment. Um, are the expectations realistic? We started out with a slide that said, hey, here's what we expect. Here's the benefits we expected, and here's the benefits we got. Are they realistic? Do you think it's going to change your whole, everything wonderfully? Probably not. Um, this next one that I have in bold is actually a little bit on the self-serving side. Um, do you have adequate training and coaching? I think going this alone is probably dangerous. Whether you use me or somebody else for your training and coaching doesn't make any difference. I would strongly urge, uh, there, there's a lot of people that sell Scrum, a lot of people, and they're all software people. They know nothing about hardware and systems. So take some care there. Um, and then uh, what I suggest people do is grab off the a first project and start from the beginning of that project and and do it. And that means you, you're you going to have to change some things because people are always going to say, well, you know, you, we can't get the team all together working on this all at the same time. And I say, well, okay, then you're doomed for failure. Because if you can't get the team working together in, in a Scrum-like way, then you're not doing Scrum. You're doing something else and it may not work. So so I was reading your uh, little uh, little box. Any innovation in a corporation will simulate the corporate immune system to create antibodies that destroy it. Uh, <laughs> scary. Yeah, I like that quote. I'll go to the next slide so we can finish up pretty much on time. Um, so five steps to make Scrum happen in our organization. Well, this is still some of the, the, this is still an extension of the previous slide. So first of all, so building on that slide, is there a team with the right skills? Um, you know, you're not gonna suddenly design a spaceship if you don't have some rocket scientists involved. So do you have the right team to make, make it happen? Um, and can you, and I mentioned this already just a moment ago, the team has to be working together. And 
for example, this one company I work with, uh, they said, well, you know, our engineers, they can't devote all their time to this one project. They got to be doing project support for all these other things. And I said, yeah. I said, so what you need to do is your team needs to dedicate three days of the week to working on this project where they're all working together on this project. The other two days of the week are their buffer. All the crap, all the other stuff that has to happen, happens in those two days. And the scrum master has to defend them those three days from being interrupted. If somebody right. comes running in on Monday and saying, hey, I need this, you say, well, wait a minute. Monday, they're working on this main project. Wednesday, they can address this. And that's part of the Scrum Master's uh, role. Somebody's going to interject something? No, this is... Okay. A... Okay. So the next one is, is the, the, is the product owner, that should have been product owner, not project owner. That's a misprint. Is, is the product owner empowered to represent the voice of the customer? And that is, does the product owner know what the, the engineers need to turn out? Is there, is there a vision uh, of what needs to be happening? Um, are the customers known and accessible? I was just on the phone the other day to a company and I said, well, do you have anybody from marketing on your team? You know, somebody that knows what the customer wants, what they need. And they said no, and I said, well, I think that may be a mistake. Um, you know, uh, you, you got to have some idea where you're going and have some feedback and communication. And then the scrum master needs to be strong enough to keep the team from being interrupted. And that was the example that I just gave. So these are just some things that'll, that'll make it happen better. Um, uh, I've got some other checklists in the other literature. That's awesome. So I think the remaining two slides, the first is a very important one. It has plenty of links about the book, about you. Actually, you are kind enough to offer free consultation. Uh, and there's a link where people can schedule 30 minutes with you. Um, yep. so, so that's really, really, really kind. I hope that people profit from this opportunity. Uh, there is a little question that I have I'm going to respond to now, which is how can we obtain the presentation? Um, this presentation with a recording of the video will be posted on the archive page, and I will be sharing it with you, uh, Nasser, as well as it will be on my LinkedIn and uh, Professor Almond's and uh, Tarbutton's uh, LinkedIn. And finally, I think this is a reading list. Yeah. Um... I put together a list of, um, of books that you might want to go to. Uh, there's plenty on the web also. Uh, I, I put some comments under them. So, so the, the real book that makes Scrum people aware of Scrum is only in 2014. That's only six years ago. And, and, and it's soft, more software oriented. It's, uh, Jeff Sutherland was one of the originators of the uh, of the method and his son JJ uh, has has been one of the big big pushers on it. Uh, you'll see down down there. There's a uh, another book by JJ that's that's much more um, much more recent. Um, and there's a couple other books there. Um, the uh, and I also reference Robert Cooper's book. His lay uh, he's the father of stage gate and. Uh, his latest version, his 2017 version, tries to push over and weave together the Agile, the Scrum, and the, the Stage Gate. And uh, he, he does a pretty good job, but he's still a Stage Gate guy, um, fundamentally. So, and then if you go to my website, I've got a book on uh, a book that's a little bit outdated, but because uh, I, I put stuff online that's much more current than the book. And I'll add that he there's a there's a short course that David has worked very hard to put together, and the graphic that you saw, the yellow graphic, is uh, readily available on his website. I've printed it out probably thirty or forty times. So, uh, David Joshua, I cannot thank you enough. This has been nothing short of a very interesting and uh, live discussion. I mean. Um, the amount of uh, questions we've got and the amount of interaction is a testimony of um, of how much people really, really liked it. 
So uh, thank you so much for that. Um, any closing words? I'm going to start with you, Joshua, and then I'm going to give it for uh, David to close it up. Any questions, Joshua? Yeah, so um, I have a, a five uh, grad students in my research group, uh, and Scrum has helped us work together, which is sometimes hard to do when you have siloed people. Um, David has, uh, I, I got um, the privilege of teaching uh, senior design and managing a lot of teams at uh, UNCC. Uh, and David has spent a lot of time to really help set us up for success. Um, we've had starts and stops. It's not easy to do great work quickly. It's very challenging. Um, I think Scrum is a way of turning down the chaos, like taking the, the chaos volume and just trying to bring it down to a, a level that's a lot more manageable, a lot more transparent and a lot uh, more clear. I, I will also add that it takes a little bit of time. It's like any new thing we try to learn. There's the, gr the grammar phase where we have to learn all these new words before we can make sense of them. You know, who's the scrum master? What is their defined role? What's a team member? What's a product owner's role? How does a product owner, you know, interface with the customer? How's that communicated? And, you know, what is the best rhythm? Does it apply to my industry? I mean, there's, there's so many, um, I guess, uh, there's a lot of information out there and I think it can be very overwhelming, but I would say, um, it can it can transform the way that you do your work and it can make it more enjoyable and it can improve the morale of your team and it's uh, it's worth the effort it's proved to be very helpful for us you know in the last 30 months we've done about and uh, we've about had about 65 customers and like 1.6 million dollars in completed design work at bravo team and I, I don't think we would have been able to get there if we didn't have uh something like this to really uh, help us try to do a better job, but it's challenging. We don't do a great job all the time. Joshua, thank you so, 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 so much for that. Um, David, um, any final words? No, I, I'd like to uh, find a way to respond to some of the questions that we haven't been able to address, but uh, we'll worry about that. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, uh, David, for... Uh, for your time, and once again, the uh, amount of uh, amount of uh, interaction we've had is a testimony of how great uh, the session uh, the session was. Thank you so much, David. My pleasure. So, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. This was a start of what I would like to say a uh, new season. Uh, this is. We have a amazing lineup of uh, people every Friday, 12 noon. Uh, make sure to uh, log in to LinkedIn. I will be streaming live on LinkedIn. Make sure to communicate with me if your company is interested in uh, being part of this. If you have something you want to share, just uh, throw me, send me a message, and I will be uh, more than happy to uh, further interact with you. Thank you so, so much. And we will talk again together uh, next week.